thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Jill Van Maitre Dupre, and I'm the interim director of the Atlas Institute. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Adit Harrell Caperton. All of us in Atlas owe Adit a tremendous amount of gratitude for her many years of service on the Atlas Advisory Board, where she was part of the team of visionaries that supported Atlas's innovative programs and also helped to make this gorgeous building a reality. She played an active part in the genesis of the National Center for Women and in Information Technology, or NCWIT, which supports and encourages the participation of women and girls in computing. It is also thanks to the generous support of Adit and her daughter, Anat Harrell, who attended CU as a TAM student, that we have presented the Atlas Speaker Series since 2006. <laughs> The vision that Adit shared with Atlas was to produce a speaker program benefiting students, faculty, and the broader Boulder and CU communities. The series would invite a wide variety of leaders and innovators from a multitude of technology-related areas to come here to CU and share ideas that challenge our thinking and broaden our perspectives. If you haven't already picked up this handout, it's over on that table and has the whole speaker series lineup for fall. Um, including Christo, the artist Christo, who will be here on October 17th in the Glenn Miller Ballroom at the UMC. But Adit herself is the perfect speaker to include in this series. She's a pioneer in using new media technology for learning, innovation, and globalization. One of the first MIT Media Lab PhDs, Adit has been developing forward-thinking platforms that combine game mechanics and social networking for learning. She is the founder of Mama Media and also the founder and CEO of Worldwide Workshop, which developed Globaloria, a social learning network where students develop digital literacies, STEM, and computing knowledge. Its activities help students worldwide sharpen their communication and critical thinking skills. Um, and in a timely <laughs> manner, Globaloria has received incredible accolades just this week. So it was named a laureate by the Tech Awards program as one of 10 innovators from around the world uh, selected and recognized for applying technology to benefit humanity. And just today, um, this just in, Silicon Valley's Education Foundation named Globaloria as the 2013 Best STEM Innovation in the category of science education. So congrats. Adit is here to share her work, some of her recent projects, and discuss some of the other efforts that hope to disrupt traditional education systems by leveraging educational technology ideas to support innovation-ready citizens. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Adit. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, very, very special treat for me to be here with you today. Um, this, this is like home for me, uh, being part of the Atlas community since its inception. Uh, when my daughter joined the college, I was asked to join the Atlas Advisory Board, and um, it was a really privilege for me to be able to, to be this young, crazy entrepreneur <laughs> from the MIT Media Lab representing what the students of the future will want to do here. I always felt that I was representing them and um, I, I hope that the, uh, in my talk I will be able to uh, express some of these ideas and principles and hopefully all of you will say yeah that's that's exactly what we're doing here in Atlas so this is very very fun uh, to be back at a as a speaker and uh, to see all of you here in the room um, I hope that you will tweet your questions, tweet your comments. I know that we are in this, this is amazing. I turned on my computer, I launched my talk, everything worked, high speed, the videos. I mean, hey, we really designed a great theater here. That's, <laughs> that's unbelievable. It never happens to me anywhere, so go Atlas. And but, so this will really be alive digitally as we all support, you know, learning both in real time and digitally. So everything that you ask and you tweet will probably blend it all together with the recording that we will show tomorrow. And hopefully this is just the beginning of a conversation that I'm so 
delighted to have with you here today, but to continue. I hope this, this is just the beginning of a conversation with this community. And so please uh, tweet with CU Atlas or MC Wheat if this is issues that are important for MC Wheat and girls and com young women in computing and at tech, at chat. And you know, my, my thing is, of course, innovation and also that coding is the new literacy, coding is the new writing, and we're trying to create that movement, uh, just approaching it in many different ways. Some of us, Mike Eisenberg is here. We've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, yeah, we're that old. We're old people in new media. And um, so this is, this is a really in interesting thing. I was, um, this is something that I would have actually have in my script to open a talk, but just yesterday came this email of Harvard's president's um, opening year address, right? So Drew Faust is telling everybody, um, new understandings of human behavior, human development, and the brain, along with advanced technology, have opened the door re um, to remarkable new possibilities for teaching and learning, face-to-face, and online. So how can we connect people and intellectual resources beyond the classroom to enhance what happens inside it? And sure enough, I googled, and I'm sure you did do a lot of these readings too, whether it's the MIT president or probably CU president or all presidents of all universities at Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, whether they are very technology-oriented universities or research-oriented university like CU or whether they're not. Everybody is now saying, this is the time to think about these issues, right? Everything that we know about child development, brain development, advanced technology, and the way we can do teaching and learning in, in, in new ways is something that, you know, this is, this is the, the, the day, the year, and the time to discuss it. So for me, it's a lot about uh, this question about learning to change. How do we learn best to change? And then, how do we change in order to learn how to learn to change, right? So this is, this is always um, interesting for me. How do you design learning environments and tools where it, it takes you to wanting to change, but it's also changing you, so you want to learn, but really what you need to learn is how to change, and to change fast, and to change all the time, and to develop in, in ways that you feel comfortable that, um, you know, Teaching and learning is happening in physical spaces and out there, and we bring things in and we take things out. And you know, what can we do here today to make it interesting? Unfortunately, that would be a lecture, not a workshop. But maybe we can turn it into something. Um, who knows? So this blending revolution, right? This blending revolution that is so exciting that I think all of us in this room, because I know a little bit about the background of the people that are here at Atlas, are excited about the idea that we, we are thinking really hard about what do we do when we are together in person, in a classroom, with teachers and students, or students learning together, or teachers learning together, or teachers choosing to teach, some, to teach something they don't know about because that's a great way to learn, students trying to figure things out with teachers, and how do we use resources from outside? How do we create resources for outside of people in our community? And here we are, seven billion people, and all of us very soon can be learners and teachers. So what technology do we need to create for that, for the seven billion of us, right? What technologies do we want to create so we understand that at certain moments in the teaching process, we're learners, and certain moments in the learning process, we're teachers, and sometimes we consume, sometimes we construct, and there are all these interdependencies and relationships and amazing technologies out there that some of us envision, some of us are using for a long time, some of us are just beginning to use, but it's exciting to think about that, that future um, and what will it do to our institutions, uh, traditional. So you see this happy girl, and uh, you see what's going on on her screen, and Maybe it's something she created right then. Maybe she's sharing it with her class on a whiteboard. Maybe she's sharing it with other students in her school or in another country. Maybe she's actually getting a tutorial from some expert in New York and she is in Wyoming. Uh, we don't know, but what we see is something that is probably very familiar for you also in colleges and universities. There is a class, there are some laptops, maybe some mobile devices. Some teachers and visitors who are trying to kind of figure out how it all works. 
And, and kids are doing teaching and learning and making stuff and receiving stuff. And this is really exciting. And so we're creating these disruptions now. And I don't, I don't know where we are heading. I don't know. I don't know. I just know it's exciting because finally, finally, we're also discussing it in cocktail parties and television. So like it's kind of a popular, it's, it's a popular thing to talk about now. My God, this is so great. Because when I used to talk about this in the 80s, <laughs> people really didn't know so much about. And even in the 90s, when I left MIT Media Lab and I went to Wall Street to raise money for my first company, people say, kids on the internet, what, what did you say they're going to do? They're going to make media on the internet for others? <laughs> Are you crazy? And when I said, yeah, very soon in 94, 95, kids for, two, for a price of two pairs of sneakers will just carry these computers on them and they will kind of talk to each other and talk to teachers in another school or another country. And we actually simulated that in the 80s at the Media Lab. People thought I was totally crazy. But I think people don't think it's crazy anymore. People just don't know what to do with it, but people don't think it's crazy anymore. That's great. So that's an advancement. And um, what's the problem? Right? Here we are. We look at these kids. You saw this smiley girl, right, sitting in a classroom with some engaged girls all around her. And, and, and we know these visuals. Some of us have been in those situations. We still are. Uh, some of our kids or grandkids are in these situations, and we don't know what to do, right? There is a big problem. I mean, if you just look at public schools, there are 50 million students in America alone, right? It's not even the billion kids that I'm talking about in the world. Here in America, 50 million students that are mostly bored most of the day. And if they're not, they're terribly lucky. They're probably in the right zip code with some talented teachers or principals, good leadership, great parents, homeschooled, whatever. They're lucky. But most of the kids kind of look like this for most of the day, and it's sad. And we all know it's not right. We all know that we have 3 million teachers that are what I call underprepared and underlearned. It's not that they're not capable, because we are all capable of learning. We are all changing. Harvard president is giving a speech that she never gave before in her life. She learned something new this past year. <laughs> you know, there is no reason why any teacher cannot learn anything that we're going to talk about here today. So they're underlearned, not giving opportunities to learn. And there are 112,000 public schools in this country alone that are underserved. Yes, there are really great charter schools and amazing private schools and a lot of lucky zip codes with extended programs and museum learnings and, and, and a lot of things that are amazing that are happening online that we know if you're lucky and you have bandwidth in your home or bandwidth in your school and your teachers know how to use it and your parents buy you the right gadgets, you're lucky. But most of the schools, most of the teachers, most of the students are not lucky, right? They're not in the right place. And so many economically underserved, uh, underprivileged communities. And in them, there are buildings that are not wired, with, with learning environments that are not like this building, with, with a lot of things that are just not right for 2013, definitely not right for 2020. And we're not doing much about it, but there is hope because we're beginning to now talk about it. In, 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 you know, in, in a way that is a little bit more casual and a little bit all-inclusive and kind of like radical on a mass scale, which makes me very happy. So I see this as a great opportunity for people like us who are in this space to just lead the change, right? We, we, we've been envisioning the change. We've been learning how to inspire change. And now we can go to these places. We're going to talk about some people who are doing it outside of these places too, right? Some of my mentors, in fact. I'm going to talk about them in a minute. But it's also important to know that there is a huge population in this country alone. And why is it important? Because from here, we can reach the 7 billion teachers and learners out there. Right? We can potentially, from every classroom, from this one or that one upstairs, or the elementary school around the corner, we can create a MOOC, we can teach anybody in India or Brazil, kids can do it, teachers can do it, right? That's amazing. You can teach and learn anywhere, from anywhere to anywhere, all the time. And that's a fabulous, fabulous thing that is happening. So, now, you know, this is, this is one image. And these girls are not doing, there was something different, right? They're still kind of leaning on the table, but I think they're a little bit more engaged. 
So there is something that is happening in their minds that was triggered by some learning environment on the screen and in their minds and in their classroom where you see them having a little bit more connection to each other and to something that they're doing. Same here. So you can be engaged as an individual, you can be engaged as a team, and you have to worry about all these aspects, both in physical environments and digital virtual environments. Um, this is a big goal for me. And I think that from those of you here that I know, it's a big goal for you too. And where do they learn all these things? Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. I try to show it anytime I can because I love these people. Uh, and uh, you can see Marvin Minsky and Nicolas Negaponte and Seymour Pepper. And these were my teachers, teachers that transformed me, transformed my life. There are, I think, about 15 objects. There's a game here. <laughs> there are 15 objects on this screen um, that we have created together or individually to, um, to inspire change to teach people how to think, how to learn, how to think about thinking, how to learn new ways of learning, how to change. And um, there can be hardware, like OLPC, or software like Mama Media, which was the first time we realized we can reach millions of kids through a browser, 95, or millions of kids through hardware all over the world, just kind of like bring it there. There are being digital of, of, of Nicolas Negaponte, who really envisioned this world that we are now in it. I can't forget that I heard him speak in 83 and 84, and he said that one day our right hand will talk to our left, left hand via satellite. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? This hand can teach that hand, <laughs> right? And um, th that was a seminal book. And so, of course, we've been with him in the 80s and the 90s as he was constructing it. This was only published in 93, but Mindstorms, of Seymour Papert. How many of you read it? Yeah. Uh, genius book, transformed my life. And, you know, this is, this is so sad that he is no longer able to be in this conversation because he was such a visionary to understand that something about computational tools and learning environments can help us construct this new reality of learning in a whole new way. Um, and, and Marvin Minsky that thought about the same thing, but how can we make machines that can learn and solve problems and even have emotions and be our companions as we solve problems or, or feel and maybe develop machines that can have a sense of humor, right? So artificial intelligence, not just to solve tic-tac-toe, but artificial intelligence that can really get into passion for learning, into having a sense of humor that get people to hook into something they're thinking about. Right? And so Society of Mind really transformed. These are all books you should kind of like in the emotion machine up there on the shelf. Um, Constructionism was um, the first book that we created um, at the Media Lab to really talk about these ideas. Initial ideas, Mike Eisenberg was part of that group too, and he's here. You're lucky to have him here and all the future thinking environments that he's developing. And so Constructionism was the first book we wrote about first experiments when we saw kids in Roxbury, Massachusetts, that had a computer that could use every day, 1985. They just had enough computers, and they can overnight send a logo program to some kids in Costa Rica. <laughs> it took all night long and whatever, 14.4 modems, whatever we used, even not as fast. And, um, and then get some code back and start sharing code, which translated into graphics on their computers that they created and realized that they like the same food than, because these are Hispanic kids in Roxbury and they named their dogs the same way and they're learning also geography in a similar way with kids in another country and these are kids that never left their street probably, right? And we saw, we saw that future through kids will one day be able to talk to other kids and share code and create some digital artifacts together that will create a common ground for a conversation about math and science and geometry and making stuff together. And that was mind blowing for us, right? This is long before, by the way, we thought about the internet, right? So that was, that was something very, very empowering. And I think a lot of these ideas 
went into this little machine um, in 2004, 2005, when that launched. And that's very exciting. Seymour Peppert's The Children's Machine, just the name of that book, The Children's Machine, in 1992, I think. It was written in the, in the early 90s, published maybe in 93 or 95, but it doesn't matter. The ideas were there in the 70s and the 80s. It's the children's machine, right? It's the children's gadget. It's for self-expression. It's for representing knowledge. It's not for so much being instructed, but it's becoming the cognitive scientist. It's becoming the instructor. This is what we're doing now. This is exactly what we're doing now. So I was lucky. <laughs> and uh, one day, I left the media lab in 94. When, when I saw Mosaic in 1993, I said, huh. Forget about one school in Roxbury and a few schools in Costa Rica, maybe one girls' school in Australia, which was really, really radical and revolutionary. I can take a browser and I'm going to reach all the kids in the world on a Monday afternoon. They're all going to do all these activities through a browser. And it's time to move into the real world. And it was a brave thing to do because the real world wasn't ready with Netscape 1.0 and there was some clunky Java, you know, it's like, really, you couldn't really create a lot of wonderful tools. Logo didn't run on internet, but nothing. I mean, it was very, very hard. You couldn't teach kids Java. It, it was really complicated, but I said, I'm going to take all these things, right? I'm going to try and create something that will you know, kind of like show what the future can be. But we're going to use it now in the real market, in the real no, real world, with home consumers on the internet. And that was, that was my story. And I hope you say, oh, she didn't change much. <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> that, that, that picture, I mean, I, actually, I had to find it in the archive and I was preparing for this. It's kind of, I think it's 1996 or something. I don't know. It's, yeah. Anyways. So what did, I, what did I learn at the Media Lab? What did I really learn at the Media Lab? This 10 magical principles that I'm kind of like trying to spread through the internet, through the MOOCs, through Mama Media, through Global Aurea. And, and as I was consulting and working together with Seymour and Nicholas when we started Old PC, as, as I'm helping Marvin Minsky with his Marvin Minsky Music Project now, which is an amazing project that is happening when they're trying to take the essence of his ideas about the mind and creativity, mind and music, and trying to make an education pro project around it. What is it? What is it that we've learned um, at the Media Lab? as a learning environment. So here are the 10 principles. One is coined by Jean Piaget, the one and only, that's the name of a book that he wrote, I think in the 60s, right? 60s, Mike, or something, maybe 50s even. To understand is to invent, read it if you didn't read it yet. So this whole notion of constructivist psychologists was that actually no deep understanding of knowledge is happening unless you're inventing something. Unless you're really coming up with a big question, thinking about it, doing research, and kind of like coming up with a solution, you do not understand. Radical. Long time ago, right? People thought about that. Learning by design. Again, that's a huge media lab principle. That we really learn better through making stuff. There was something special about the convergence of mechanical engineering and software engineering and, and tools and digital tools or hardware tools and the way we were thinking about design and music and filmmaking and self-expression. And we were the group that were trying to figure out to understand is to invent and learn through design for kids. That was our job at the Media Lab with all the other groups. To create in teams, right? that there were a lot of conversations when I was a PhD student back in those days, like, will there be a teen PhD? And as we are moving towards the world of MOOCs, you know, it's, it's a very relevant question. I don't think the Harvard president thought about that yet, right? Right now she's just trying to think about how am I combining the online with the offline. Raphael, the president of MIT, does the same. You know, why are we in a campus? Let's make it worth it, the amount of money we're charging, and what can we move to virtual? But what about this amazing skill of teaching and learning together, inventing stuff together? What, what about that, 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 that most of the problems really require teams and interdisciplinary work, and we sort of need to figure out how do we learn in teams? It's a skill, right? And it's also 
completely necessary. It's not luxury. There is no problem we can solve today alone. Together or die, I love that one. Maybe you heard me talk about this before, but it used to be to publish or perish, and Nicolas Negaponte coined this, demo or die. And it's the idea that if you have an idea, um, try to create a prototype, try to create a demo, so you can share as soon as possible, even half-baked, with a community of thinkers, hopefully very diverse people coming from different, and, and they're kicking the tire. And they're looking at their demo, and we're looking all at their demo, they're looking at our demo, and something has happened through the process of design as we invent something, we build a prototype and a demo for it, we talk about it, and all of a sudden we see our idea doesn't work, we have to really change it, we go back into this, what we call the industry standard iterative engineering, right? That's, that's that. How do we design courses around that? And of course, to learn learning. Major principle, which is in a world that is changing all the time, the most important thing is to learn how to learn, to learn how to think about your thinking, to learn how to be reflective about yourself as a learner and to develop confidence in, and skill in your ability as a learner. And that's the main thing. Even when we talk about how do we bring more girls to computing? How do we create more engineers at every university? By the way, Drew Faust is finishing her speech by saying it's, we are starting. We're starting new programs for engineering and computer science at Harvard. It's time you know, for us to really grow that expertise. Well, how are they going to do this? People really have to learn how to learn, and they can really get to this from many different sides. Um, an important Margaret Minsky principle, Seymour Papert's principle, is to think like a child. Sometimes the best way to solve a problem or to invent something, it's to kind of like be playful with it, uh, be a little naive, take a risk, right? Not think about what's not gonna work, but be very optimistic, very entrepreneurial. That's how kids think, at least that's how it's documented in the literature. And even if they're not always right, they just do it and then they discover. To dream big, right? That was a major principle at the Media Lab. If our dreams were not big enough, it, it was not allowed to work on them. <laughs> Literally, we will not get funded, our professors will not like us, Nicolas will never talk about us. <laughs> you had to dream big. And if you really dream really big, everything good happens. I mean, it's amazing. It's to cultivate that idea that, you know, ask big questions. Take a risk and ask really big questions that nobody ever thought about before, and nobody will ever think it's ridiculous that you're really picking the hardest question in the world to solve that, you know, kind of um, dream big. Eight. To never fear change, we talked a little bit about that before already, but it's something about your idea and the team that you're putting together and the demo that you build and the, the kind of understanding process that you go through invention is really requiring to break a system, to, to, to take a concept that everybody believes in and you say, no, I'm going here, right? It's not so much about evolution, it's about revolution, it's about dreaming big and thinking about change as you're constructing your next big idea. And to empower, to empower people with ideas, not with information, it's about construction and not just consumption. And that, yes, there is a, lot, a role for information and, and, and all of this in the way that I'm delivering you our principles now, because I hope that you will then construct something with them, or maybe you came here because you're ready for this information versus other people that didn't come today and to impact the world. So at MIT, that's an MIT principle, actually. We're all engineers. We're all trying to really solve the world's most pressing problems. There was no other reason to come to MIT and learn technology unless you really want to do something to impact the world. And th this is something that I've learned. It was very profound at the Media Lab that let's do something that can really matter and change. But all these 10 principles, actually, if you look at them, as I hinted already, are not new. Right? 100 years, 100 years of knowledge. I happen to study with Seymour Papert, with Howard Gardner, with David Perkins, uh, John Seeley Brown. I, I met and, and talked with Jerry Brunner, uh, very familiar with Montessori and Jean Piaget and John Dewey and Levy Gotsky. I didn't study with them, but I studied with people who worked with them and studied with them. 
was very, very fortunate. And so there is something about what all these thinkers have been telling us about learning how to read and learning how to write, the power of storytelling, learning, learning by doing, social construction of knowledge and proximal development, and learning to be versus, right? All, you can go person by person, and you can see these 10 principles in one way, one incarnation or another. So those of us who were at the epistemology and learning group, we had kind of like a little advantage at the media lab because we also studied these thinkers. And we kind of like look at these thinkers and say, OK, what can we do to really cultivate learning environments that really open these minds and, and create expert learners? But what did we see? We saw that in public schools, still today, not just back then, <laughs> we were studying thinkers and we were thinking about thinking, but public schools studied subjects and they were thinking about homework, right? In schools, people had worksheets given by teachers. They were encouraged to imitate and to repeat. We were encouraged to do projects, envision, invent, play, and create. Teachers are instructors versus teachers are actually explorers together with us. Required to, we are required to move around, not to sit still, explore things with teachers together. Usually in, in school, we are driven to excel in an existing knowledge base that is like the core curriculum in well-defined small problems and small projects versus being asked to really drive a whole new um, uh, body of knowledge and to uh, create prototypes for some asking new questions uh, and dream big. And usually there are assignments submitted to teachers. And actually, you'll be surprised. The first time I got an assignment in 1983 from Seymour Peppert, and it was about um, write about a learning experience that really inspired you when you were little, that really affected the way you think about yourself as a learner. We all came with our papers. We put it, we, we submitted it to Seymour Papert, and he went, Jacqueline, can you make 30 copies of each paper so everybody can read everybody's papers? That's social media in 1983, right? He was not interested to sit and read all of this. He wanted all of us to read everybody else's papers, and that's going to make that knowledge construction socially interesting and actually create an understanding. So the, I remember that first time, I didn't write it for like everybody to read. And uh, whew, that's scary. I, I kind of like thought about Seymour as my audience. And I see the same thing today when we're asking Global Learner students to participate in the learning network or in a MOOC. And all of a sudden, we ask them to post everything they say, they do, they reflect, they blog, they code. Ooh, they're like, I remember that moment. And it was scary. But once we got into it, it was so empowering to be able to know that everything that I write, I will also be able to read somebody else's essay, project, code, whatever we did. So it's this interplay, right, between instruction and construction, between instructionism and constructionism, which are actually the two sides of the same cognitive equation. I'm not such a purist that say that instructionism is totally not good. I think we go through periods, we go through moments, even within the same hour, within the same project, where we need to be instructed, we need to be guided, we want to read a lot, we, our ears are open, we are ready. But the, we, we want to kind of think about what is driving what. So in that revolution, that you know, in, in my personal mission, in my personal obsession or drive, I was trying to get that DNA from these 10 magical principles of constructionism and instructionism, and that maybe constructionism drive the instructionism, not vice versa, and trying to bring it to school. But just a minute before we talk about how we do it in school, let's go to the master who created the Media Lab. He broke away. He's not interested in schools anymore, right? What Nicholas is interested in now, which is really important to remember, right, is, OK. <laughs> All of us are trying to now bring it to schools and disrupt education systems, and we feel socially responsible. I'm a social entrepreneur. That's the problem I chose to solve, right? I've been at this for many, many years. I'm in that space, and I'm going to tell you about what I'm doing in that space that I think is, is pretty radical and very wonderful. He's already five steps ahead, right, as usual. And he's thinking about a whole new way of learning in Ethiopia, these kids right, are getting to learn 
um, I actually brought a video. In places when there are no schools and no teachers, we can still take all these principles, he thinks. And he works with amazing people in Tufts on that problem and announced an X prize that is very exciting in that topic. Now, I don't see my control here, but I, th I think that is still OK. And you are seeing this on the screen. Let's play a clip of this. My name is Mikhail and I'm working for Guadalajara Per Child. Um, we have a new project in here that wants to prove if the kids can learn, can learn how to read by themselves. So this is uh, Wenchi, so it's um, around 200 kilometers from Addis, which one of the sites we selected uh, here for the project. Our basic requirements are we were looking for uh, little uh, community which the kids never have go to go to school or never have an access for technology. So after that, um, we came here and gave, gave them uh, tablets in order to prove if they can teach by themselves how to read. So the, the, the main objective is if the kids can read by themselves, they can also teach themselves any other things. Okay, so as I'm working in taking all these Media Lab constructionist principles into MOOCs that will go into schools and to teach coding, engineering, design, innovation, they're trying to already go ahead and show what do we do with this self-driven, learning by themselves, teaching by themselves, themselves and each other, literacy, ABC, one to three, arithmetic. So they're in the three R's, but they're doing something that is totally inventive for demonstrating the future of this. And I think that, um, that you, you, you should Google this and look uh, you know, closer at, at what it is. And um, there is another person who's doing fascinating, oops, how did that happen? You all know Sugata Mitra, um, inspired, um, inspired Nicholas, and you know, with the hole in the wall. How many of you know the hole in the wall? You do know the hole in the wall. And his recent TED Prize, I actually um, asked Stephanie to zero up some of blogs that I wrote, and one of it was when he received the X Prize on building schools in the cloud. So he's still talking about school. Nicholas is not talking about a school. He's talking about a village that get to teach and learn together with each other basic literacy. And Mitra is saying, you can actually create a school with classes. The teachers will be these grannies who are like, they have all the time in the world. And they're going to kind of figure out how to create personal relationship with kids in India or anywhere down the road. And it, he does take some school concept with courses and and, and, and curriculum, but he's putting it on the cloud and getting to drive. Um, I'll just show a, a tiny little clip of this because that's the thing that inspired it all. The question, how will it scale? We're not sure, but. Thinking of banking in Africa? Think Zenith. Zenith Bank PLC is one of the biggest banks uh, in Africa with about a million shareholders. Let them pay for programming. Nigeria, Can I stop this? In other African countries and the United Kingdom. Committed to the best possible customer experience. Then it's back in your best interest. Here we go. Children clamor to get a look at something fascinating. What is it? A computer. 
Some children in India have never had access to one before. I come here every day. That's why I am happy, says nine-year-old Shabanam as she plays with the educational games. What you are seeing inspired the book Q&A, which eventually inspired the movie Slumdog Millionaire. What can our Slumdog possibly know? It's called The Hole in the Wall Project, dreamed up by a scientist in Delhi who wondered what would happen if he stuck a computer in a wall in a poor neighborhood and let children have free access to it with no supervision, only a monitor that researchers can peer through in another location. So, that uh, kids were beginning to do interesting things, and in a couple of days... Okay, so please go and watch these things. I think it's fascinating to think about schools in the clouds, and learning without schools, without teachers. Nicholas says that there are 100 million kids in need of services like this. And guess what? I think the apps that are on these tablets or laptops in the villages and the things that the kids are watching on the screens can be created by kids in Boulder, Colorado. Right? Why not? You don't need Pearson to create that stuff. Ridiculous. Right? Our kids can learn. Whatever they need to teach, whether it's ABC 1 to 3 or maybe chemistry or biology, I mean, they can, if you tell them that's your, that's your project, design some things for these kids to learn, what do you want them to learn today? They will. Right? So I see, I see all these projects very complementary and they're all part of a global ecosystem. And we kind of like, it, it can be teachers in all these countries, it can be students in all these countries, and there, there, there can be something that can happen when we all give, receive, take, all these radical gifting that can happen around, around these things. So these are all very exciting things that drove me to do Mama Media, which I'm not going to talk about today, although I love talking about Mama Media, in the first internet era. <laughs> and then in the second internet era, when social media started, I thought, wait a second, people said, you know, try to move it into mobile, let's do these apps. I said, hmm, I'm going to create a platform where all the kids can create Mama Media. I don't want to be a publisher anymore, right? What I want to do is use, like, create, look at this Facebook, but why isn't Facebook for learning? What a waste. You know, look at LinkedIn. I mean, we can all teach and learn and create apps for each other and, you know, spread good things, not just celebrity photos or photos of ourselves, which I love doing on Facebook. And, you know, we can create a good Facebook, right? Where you can learn how to learn and you can learn how to change. So, you see a kid like this, and we saw the kids that are like, you know, th there were some kids sitting like this in the first picture I show. This is a brilliant picture, actually, that a photographer from Digital Directions from Ed Week came and he took, he says, I would like to photograph game makers, <laughs> like coders who are kids, and I want to see what I get, like as an artist. And he took the most amazing pictures, which, again, this is a coin, a term that Seymour Peppard coined hard fun. I mean, he took amazing photographs of kids making apps for other kids, of kids making games for other kids. I think I can stop talking now. <laughs> I mean, I think problem solved. There is some engagement here that a casual photographer in Tigritz Valley Middle School or high school in West Virginia or in San Jose in Silicon Valley, California, he can randomly come with a camera and he can take portraits of kids working together, solving problems, and doing it in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of places, in ways that resemble Google, not school. An engineer from graduate school here at CU, right? And they're, they're, you, you don't know, it doesn't matter what age, they're probably problem on, working on a similar problem. The engineer right now in his office at CU and this kid. <laughs> this kid is employable, by the way. Yeah. They're all employable. The skills that they're learning with Global Area are amazing. But it's not so important that they're like ready for career and college and all that stuff. I'm, I'm happy about that. That's what helps me sell this to school. But what's happy is especially how they love it and how they're engaged in it and how much learning about learning that they're doing. Okay, so Global Area is this weird MOOC that is based on constructionist principles. And it is a flipped classroom but not flipped in the sense that you watch the lecture at home and you come to the classroom to talk about it. It's flipped because you're actually in the classroom moving from learning through design to peer-to-peer -peer learning, watching a lecture, talking with your teacher, learning together, or 
clicking exactly where you want to click to watch a tutorial or to get expert live to give you badges and review your games because your teacher is not able to do it or your peers. So you're moving into all these formats of learning in the constructionist tradition and you're learning, right, how to play. You're learning through play, just like you're reading books. You're learning to ask big questions, do research, create design documents, plan. You're learning to demo, to prototype. You're doing it alone in some iterations, and in some iterations our courses ask you to do it as a team. You then learn how to build your demo and code. And it's a really nice gateway to bring a lot of kids who are naturally don't want to design or engineer a code. And then you learn to publish it, to present it, to talk about it. And it is very, very, very intensely about participation. You can't really be on this MOOC unless you're posting and sharing and commenting because everybody in your classroom sees exactly where you are. There are progress trackers. That you can, you can, people can see your doodles, your writings, your blogs, your logs. Everything is there. And we are, it's a training wheels, too, to teach kids how to exist in such a rich environment when they're making, inventing, creating, playing, commenting, and coding. And so it's, it's kind of like in places that we work, um, this, I believe, will teach them how to then say, oh, I want to take a course in Coursera, or the Coursera that will be better in the future. I really want to take you know, your course or your course, whoever here who is a faculty member who is developing course. I want our students to be able to be also practicing the joy of learning in this blended way. So we do see community participation. We induce all these motivational things where we, we introduce it to low performing students and very gifted students. We, we introduced it to boys and girls in middle school and high school, some elementary school recently, after school summer programs, boys and girls clubs, more formal, less formal situations. Core curriculum, it's the math course for credit and grade. It's the elective, game design one, game design two. We customize it. I was just talking to Wendy who does research on, on Global Area Girls in, in um, Austin, Texas, in uh, San Jose, California, in West Virginia. And she says, it, it is really, they're all going to Global Aurora, but each, each deployment is so different, which we are so proud. It's the same course. It's just customized to whatever the teacher wants to do in that blended situation with students. So it's hard for her to even compare and contrast the girls and what they're gaining, because it's so different, whether it's a first-year teacher, second-year teacher, did they get a lot of expert-guided tutorials or not? how much they interacted with a team in New York versus not, do they do it every day or just twice a week, do they do it in school or after school, do they do it for credit or not, right? But that's what the MOOC is allowing you to choose and then we customize everything um, for you. So if, if all individuals really need to learn, which I believe they do, um, I gave you the manifesto in that handout, all individuals do really need to learn how to learn through computational thinking and coding and uh, learning to design, learning to work in teams, learning to build demos, learning to prototype. Then, <coughs> we, you know, this is really the new writing. And you heard me speak about the fact that um, we don't expect people to be literate if they just know how to read without writing. And you can't really just learn how to write without reading. The more you read, the better writer you become. The more you write, <coughs> the better reader you become. But not all of us learn how to write because we're becoming journalists or novelists or reporters. We learn how to write as a pathway to thinking, to prosperity, to leadership, to living in a democracy, to communication, to mobilizing communities, right? There's a lot of purpose to learning how to write. Same thing with coding, with engineering, and with design. So we can't live in a world where all these kids are getting their apps since age one or two or three and playing with all these things as consumers without teaching them how to create it, right? We, it's a responsibility, I think, that we have to create literacy. And we cannot just think that teaching kids here in the developed world how to read and write and do arithmetic is enough. I think we really need to um, take into consideration that we have to teach them also how to work alone and together 
in blended situations, whether it's home and online, school and online, friends here and friends there, and how to move very smoothly and understand where do you do what. It's a new kind of skill. It's a new kind of skill, I think, for well-being, right? For being a digital citizen, for participating in democracy. Um, I will move. I will move forward, in in the sense that you all know that it's very sad that certain certain schools. I think very few. Again, Wendy gave me some of the statistics. Very few offer computing or like serious project-based STEM. Um, and and it's not like it doesn't exist. And there are a lot of pockets of amazing things beyond the glory. Lots of you are working on things, uh, and there are a lot of great things out there. And the more, the merrier. But it's not yet everywhere, and it's not yet like reading and writing. And I think um, we really have to make sure we are providing um, everybody with the, with the opportunities. And in Global Aurea, we are creating all these motivational hooks. We have the Glow Beat game design competition to paste students through the course. We're helping teachers by training them. Uh, and we are. We are, we are trying to really, we, we've been with 8,000 students and educators in um, many different states. Right now, we're actually in five states. As we speak, we can go to 1,500 girls and 1,500 boys and really see what they're working on. And the dream is actually to take it internationally and, yes, in the school space, so then we can work with all of these kids who are out of school with no teachers, the 100 million or 200 million no matter how you want to look at this, or even more, the one billion learners out there uh, in the world to teach them. Now, I was told that I can go until 5.30, and any of you that want to leave, there will be a recording tomorrow. I want to dig deeper in the next five or 10 minutes uh, on the platform technology. Uh, and um, we have five interconnected platforms, OK? We've built something that is actually very special as the MOOC because we have students and educators with all the digital curriculum and all the courses that we teach with individual project spaces and community project spaces and a shared Global Aurea central platform that um, is allowing everybody to share what they're working. We have an educator's platform for teachers to learn by doing as well. We have the learning management system and we have our network management system to post courses, to understand what, who is doing what and where. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And I know you have to run to your classes. And let's be in touch online. Um, and we can, uh, you can go on test drive, globalaria.org test drive, request an account, and play with it. If you have any courses that you think you want to collaborate with us uh, in bringing into the, in bringing into the um, Global Aurea Michael, well, please let me know. Uh, there is a lot of um, questions that uh, we can talk about uh, right now. I already covered this. Um, let's look actually at this video, and then we'll open the questions. My name is Sarah Ellen. I'm a senior at Greenberries High School, and I'm in my first year of Global Aurea. The name of our game is Don't Be Mean, Go Green. My partner, Tyler, and I, we are concerned about the future of the Earth. So we decided to pick a topic that would teach others about the environment and what's best for it. Our first question is, you know, you're going on a five-mile trip, and you have three choices. You have a car, a bus, and a bike. If you choose the car, you lose the game because the car gives off pollution. If you choose the bus, you gain points, but you do not get to play the bonus mini game. With the bike, you gain the most amount of points and you move on to play the mini game. Well, Global Laurea is very similar to the scientific method. You know, you pick what you want to do, like you would hypothesize what's the problem. You would gather your information, you would test it, and if it didn't work, you would analyze what your problem is and try it again. The same thing happens with coding. So it is very similar to science, and with math, you have to get the right numbers or the solution is wrong. You learn more about technology itself, and you get skills for as technology is advancing, you'll be caught up with the times. With researching the stuff for our game, we learn more about it because it's hands-on, and we do it over and over and over again. The knowledge sticks within our minds, so we do keep it, and it does carry on. And actually, she's doing Global Aurea with her music teacher. 
who's also the band teacher and the gym teacher. And he's talking about the scientific, <laughs> the scientific method, which I find it um, very, very interesting. Um, let's go. These are, these are again, girls in, in different schools that we do, in all-girls schools. And we have in research reports that really talk about computational thinking development, gender issues, uh, girls developing self-efficacy and uh, confidence. We have demo days and open houses and digital learning days for parents, for researchers to come and talk to these students and teaching the students how to present. We take them on field trips. Uh, one of the things that our research shows is that a lot of these kids can't even imagine what is a STEM job? What is a computing job? They don't come from families that actually talk about this or experience this in their families. These are two middle school kids. I, I don't know if, if this is where they are with Adobe or Microsoft. Uh, a lot of our partners invite kids to come and give to the executives presentation. And just a minute before they went on the stage, there were like 10 executives on the stage and they were from HR and from marketing and from engineering and technology and IT. And you know, they, they told the kids that they have to learn how to engineer and design and code because they can then get all these different jobs. You don't only have to be the novelist, right? You don't always have to be the coder, but it can be a pathway to a lot of different kinds of jobs. And then the kids present their games and these executives cry and it's like a really, uh, they can't believe this. And um, it's, it's a really exciting, it's a really exciting moment.